continue now with our look at the Reformation in Europe. The pioneer of Protestantism in Western Switzerland was William Farrell. Some pronounce it Farrell. Uh, we're going to go with a more traditional Farrell. Farrell began as an itinerant evangelist, always in motion. He was tireless, full of faith, and, well, fire. He was as bold as Luther, but quite frankly, more radical. He lacked Luther's genius. He's called the Elijah of the French Reformation and the scourge of priests. Once a devoted Roman Catholic who studied under pro-reform professors at the University of Paris, Farrell became a loyal Protestant, but able to see only what was wrong with the Catholicism of his past. He loathed the Pope, branding him an Antichrist, as did many Protestants of that time. Now, of course, the Popes returned the favor and labeled Reformation leaders with the same title. Farrell claimed that all the statues, pictures, relics found in Roman churches were heathen idols that ought to be destroyed. Farrell was never officially ordained, but he thought of himself as divinely called, like a prophet of old, to break down idolatry and to clear the way for the worship of God according to God's word. He was a born fighter and, echoing Jesus, said that he came not to bring peace but a sword. He contended with priests who did carry firearms and clubs under their frocks and fought them with the spiritual sword of scripture. Once he was fired at, but the gun blew up. Turning to the man who'd shot at him, he said, quote, I'm not afraid of your shots, unquote. He never used violence himself, except in the verbal salvos that he was fond of firing at his critics. Pharrell was never discouraged or dissuaded by opposition. On the contrary, persecution kind of stimulated him to even greater labor. His outward appearance gave no hint to his indomitable will. He was short and frail. His pale complexion was often sunburned. He sported a wild red beard. What his appearance lacked, his voice made up for. He used both gestures and language that commanded attention and produced conviction on the part of his hearers. His contemporaries referred to the thunder of his eloquence and the earnestness of his moving prayers. His sermons were extemporaneous, that is, he didn't sit down to prepare a message. He wasn't one to deliver a three-point sermon where each point began with the same letter. No, their power lay in their delivery. Sadly, all that we can say is what others reported about his preaching. None of his messages were ever preserved because, well, he never wrote them down. As is often the case, his strength ended up being a weakness, maybe a fatal weakness. His lack of moderation and discretion unburdened him from well, second-guessing himself. He spoke his mind without the need to put a fine point on everything. In a word, he lacked tact. He didn't care if what he said upset people. This outspokenness repeatedly got him into trouble, not only with Roman Catholics, but with his Protestant peers. Imagine two surgeons. They're equally skilled at correcting internal problems. One carefully cuts to make the healing of the incision site leave the smallest scar. And she does three surgeries a day. The other surgeon is less concerned with that. He wants to get in there and get it done. He does five surgeries a day. His surgeries, well, they leave a bigger scar, but more people are served. Now, which is the better surgeon? Well, it depends on what's important to you, the scar or getting the surgery sooner. William Farrell, <laughs> he was the second surgeon. He was an iconoclast. His verbal violence provoked unnecessary opposition and often did more harm than good. One Reformation leader of the time wrote Pharrell saying, quote, your mission is to evangelize, not curse. Prove yourself to be an evangelist, not a tyrannical legislator. Men want to be led, not driven, unquote. Shortly before his death, Zwingli exhorted Pharrell not to be so rash. And that may be a good way to see Pharrell's contribution to the Reformation. His work was destructive rather than constructive. He could pull down, he, he couldn't build up. He was a conqueror, not an organizer of those conquests. He was a man of action, not a man of letters. A preacher, not a theologian. In a large construction company, the first team that comes in, well, it's the demolition crew. Their job is to clear away the old and prepare for the new. Pharrell? It was a one-man demo squad, a religious wrecking crew. Now, the thing is, he knew it. And he handed his work over to the genius of his younger friend, John Calvin. 
you'll remember that it was William Farrell who had persuaded Calvin to help out in Geneva. In the spirit of genuine humility and self-denial, he was willing to decrease that Calvin might increase. This is the finest trait in his character. He didn't own what God chose to do through him. He really believed that he was but a servant, just a tool in God's hand. And he admitted that he was a rough tool at that. William Farrell, oldest of seven children of a noble but poor family, was born in 1489 at Gop. No, he wasn't born in the changing room of a clothing store in the mall, not Gap. <laughs> Gop it was a village in the French Alps where the Waldensians once lived. He inherited the Roman Catholic faith of his parents, and while still young, he made a pilgrimage with them to a supposed piece of miracle-working wood believed to have been taken from the original cross. He shared in the superstitious veneration of pictures, relics, bowed before the authority of monks and priests. He was, as he later said of that period of his life, more popish than the pope. <laughs> At the same time, he had a great thirst for knowledge and was sent to Paris to further his education. There, he studied ancient languages, philosophy, theology. His main teacher was Jacques Lefebvre, pioneer of the French Reformation and translator of the scriptures who introduced Pharrell to Paul's epistles and the doctrine of justification by faith. Lefebvre told Pharrell in 1512, My son, God will renew the world and you will witness it. Pharrell acquired a Master of Arts in 1517 and was appointed teacher at the College of Cardinal Le Mans. Now, the influence of Lefebvre and the study of the Bible brought Pharrell to the conviction that salvation can be found only in Christ and that the Word of God is the only rule of faith. He was amazed that he could find in the New Testament no trace of Pope, church hierarchy, indulgences, purgatory, the Mass, seven rather than two sacraments, a sacerdotal celibacy, and the worship of Marian saints. When Lefebvre was charged with heresy in 1521, he retired but remained an advocate for reformation within the Catholic Church without separation from Rome. Now, we'll talk about the Catholic Counter-Reformation in a later episode. In retirement, Lefebvre translated the New Testament into French, publishing it in 1523. Now, this was virtually simultaneous with Luther's German New Testament. Pharrell and several others of Lefebvre's students followed him, and began preaching a Reformation message under his influence. But Pharrell proved, well, he proved too radical and was forbidden to preach. He returned to his hometown and, well, he made some converts there, including four of his brothers, but the people found his doctrine strange and they drove him away. France became dangerous as the persecution of Protestants had begun there as it already had in some other places. So Pharrell fled to Basel, Switzerland. Since Reformation ideas were being tolerated there, he held a public disputation in Latin on 13 issues in which he affirmed the inspiration of the scriptures, Christian liberty, the duty of pastors to preach the gospel, the doctrine of justification by faith, and denounced images and celibacy. This speech led to the conversion of a Franciscan monk named Pelican, a distinguished Greek and Hebrew scholar who became a professor at Zurich. Now, Pharrell delivered more public lectures and sermons, but as his popularity grew, so did his bombast. And Erasmus persuaded the town council to brand him a disruptor of the peace and have him expelled. So after bouncing around for a few years as an itinerant preacher, he arrived in Neuchâtel in December of 1529, where he was instrumental in bringing the Reformation to the city. Pharrell stopped at Geneva in early October of 1532. The day after he arrived, he was visited by a number of distinguished citizens of the Protestant French Huguenots, and Pharrell explained to them from an open Bible the Protestant doctrines that would complete and consolidate the political freedom they had recently achieved. But rather than receive this with joy, they were troubled and demanded Pharrell and his friends leave. Well, Pharrell refused. He said that he wasn't trying to create trouble. He was simply a preacher of truth for which he was ready to die. He showed them letters of reference from several Reformation leaders, which, well, made quite an impression on them. When the Roman clergy in Geneva began to harass Pharrell, this only further uh, ingratiated him with the Protestants there. But the Catholics became so angry at Pharrell's refusal to budge, the entire city was set on edge. The council demanded that he leave immediately. 
He barely escaped as priests pursued him with their clubs. He left covered with spit, bruises. Some of the Huguenots came to his defense and accompanied him across Lake Geneva. Now, since the Reformation in Geneva was gaining ground and the city was seen as key, the Catholics called Guy Furbity, a Dominican doctor of theology, to refute the Protestants. He stirred the Catholics of Geneva into a violent mob. All preaching in the city had to be approved by him. Now, you can imagine how Pharrell felt about that. He returned with a guarantee of protection from the city of Bern and held another public disputation with Furbity at the end of January of 1534. In the presence of both the great and the small councils of Geneva and delegates from Bern, he was unable to answer all of Forbidi's objections, but he denied the right of the church to impose ordinances which, which were not authorized by scripture and defended the position that Christ was the only head of the church. He used the occasion to explain Protestant doctrines and to attack Roman church hierarchy. Christ and the Holy Spirit, he said, are not with the Pope, but with those whom he persecutes. The disputation lasted several days and ended in a, well, partial victory for Pharrell. Unable to argue from the scriptures, Furbity confessed, quote, What I preach, I cannot prove from the Bible. I have learned it from the Summa of St. Thomas, unquote, meaning, of course, Thomas Aquinas. Pharrell continued to preach in private homes as tension grew between the Protestants and the Catholics. He was the eye of the storm. As more and more Genevans embraced Reformation ideas, priests, monks, and nuns began to leave, and the bishop transferred his see to a different city. On August 27th of 1535, the Genevan Council issued an Edict of Reformation. That was followed several months later with an even more thorough embrace of Reformation ideas. The Mass was abolished, images and relics were removed from churches, as citizens pledged themselves by an oath to live according to the precepts of the Gospel, a school was established for the education of the young, and out of it grew the Academy of John Calvin. All shops were closed on Sunday. A strict discipline, which extended even to headdress of brides, was introduced. Hey, man, when you can tell brides what to do, <laughs> that's serious. This was the first act in the history of the Reformation at the city of Geneva. It was the work of Pharrell, but only preparatory to, uh, to the more uh, important work of, of course, John Calvin. Now, the people were anxious to get rid of the Catholic rule of the Duke of Savoy and the bishop. They had no conception of evangelical religion and would not submit to discipline. They mistook freedom for license. They were in danger of falling into the opposite extreme of disorder and confusion. And that was the state of things when Calvin arrived in Geneva in the summer of 1536 and was urged by Pharrell to assume the great task of building a new church on the ruins of the old. Though 20 years his senior, Pharrell willingly took a subordinate position to Calvin. He labored for a while as Calvin's colleague, but was banished from Geneva with him when their reforms were, well, deemed by the city council as too ambitious and too narrow. Calvin then went to Strasbourg, while Pharrell accepted a call as pastor at Neuchâtel, where he'd worked before. Now, for the bulk of his remaining 27 years, Pharrell remained the lead pastor there in Neuchâtel. Thank you.